<clears throat> the gospel this Sunday is taken from the gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Jesus left there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things, they said? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? And how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this a carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his home town, among his relatives and in his household. He was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. He summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the road except a staff. No bread, no traveling bag, no money in their belts, no passport, no credit cards. But to wear sandals, not put on an extra shirt. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place does not welcome you or listen to you when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons, anointed many sick, sick people with oil, and healed them. This the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's go into the word today, shall we? <clears throat> Last week, we were in the gospel of Mark as well. And uh, there was two healings that took place. The one that stood out was the woman that had been subject to bleeding for many, many years and snuck up behind him, if you would, and uh, grabbed hold of his cloak and was healed. And we talked about in, 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 in that healing, Jesus turned around, if you remember, and said, who touched me? Power has gone out from me. I'd like to focus on that power today as we go into today's text, which is the following text of, of Mark. Lord, please open our hearts as we go into your word today and speak to us as only you can. There are countless voices in this world, <laughs> countless Voices in all over. Your voice is the only one that speaks life and healing and power, forgiveness, joy, and peace. So we pray that you open our ears to be able to hear. This we pray in your great name, Lord. Amen. Today is a message, if you will, about power. And um, power is a, uh, kind of be a word that can um, get our attention. But when we take a look at what Jesus is experiencing in this chapter, the people that he goes to speak to are amazed. Not, at, not only is his wisdom, but his authority. And the, his ability to do things that uh, they don't know how he's, he can do it. He's healing people. They're astonished. Per miracles performed by his hand. And they take offense at him. Because there's two ways, basically, of pursuing or living from or experiencing power. There's a power that we and from our humanity, create institutions, etc. And there's the power of God. And when we invest our time in conventional power, we can get really frustrated 
when people are appear to be able to execute it and have it more than we do. So if you take a look at the bigger picture, Mary is given this revelation from God before Jesus' birth. This boy that you're going to have, this child, is going to be a great man. He's going to be a great leader of Israel. He's going to do things that the prophets foretold he would do. Now, let that sink into your head if you were Mary. Ooh, maybe he's going to go to UC Davis. Maybe he'll go and, and get a full ride scholarship and become very, very instrumental in the political field of whatever the case may be. Maybe he'll be a very successful business person and be able to influence. Maybe he'll be very uh, famous and have lots of endorsements for Nike. This is how the world pursues power. Influence, prestige. Social institutions acknowledging their authority. And when he's not doing that, I'm imagining Mary going, this isn't making sense. I'd kind of like to have some grandchildren to run around in my old age, and he's not even married. I hear that a lot. Not in my house. I don't want grandkids yet. Okay. That's, we gotta have to have that, that, that. That's a successful life. And here's this guy. He's got no prospects. He's got a pretty decent living, I would imagine, from his father's business or the family business. But he's not going to the schools that he should be going to. He's not getting the recommendations. He's not getting the paperwork and the accolades from all of the people that are in power that have the namesake. Because, you know, when you get power, your name carries with it power. Right? Have you ever heard of the Kennedys? <laughs> So he's not doing any of that. And yet there's this power, and this is the conflict, but yet he's healing people. And he's doing things that we've never seen anybody. In fact, we read previously that his disciples were amazed because the wind and the waves obey him. And so here's this conflict. Everything that we pursue power for, and really power is just another word for grace, Grace is what we're designed to do. We were designed to do, to execute power on God's behalf, power that we don't have. It's God's power, but power that flows through us in order to accomplish our intention, our purpose as human beings, which is to be God's image bearer. If you bear God's image, power will flow. God is power. And so they're really, well, they're offended. Who, are, who, who do you think you are? You come in here and, and, we, and we all have power structures. You got to go up. You got to climb the ladder. You don't just throw yourself in positions of authority. And he says to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown among his relatives and his household. He's not able to do a single. Well, he can do a few things, but not very much power. Then. Right after that, he summoned the 12 and began to send them out and gave them authority, power. And herein lies the dichotomy between God power and worldly power. Godly power is only experienced through obedience. That is the only way to experience grace is obedience. We can talk about faith all we want and talk about creeds and doctrines and understandings. And those are good to have discussions around and get clarity about. But without obedience, there's no power and Jesus repeatedly makes this clear in the Gospel of John in particular. I can't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. 
So obedience is essential. It is a requirement. It is a non-negotiable to experiencing the kingdom of God. It doesn't come by simply agreement with a particular creed. It doesn't come from, quote, membership within an organization. It doesn't come from scholastic knowledge. You can have a PhD in linguistics and know the scriptures inside and out, but without obedience, you are nothing more than a doctor degree on a piece of paper. And obedience is something that is difficult to wrap our minds around because now we are experiencing as disciples the obedience that comes by faith, as Paul says. And the obedience that comes by faith is, is well, it's, it's kind of a mis mystery because it's not a code. You see, for the first 300 years, Christianity is just flourishing. It's, it's like a wildfire. It's just going everywhere in the, in the ancient world. But when Rome took over, when the imperial government took over, they turned obedience and directed the obedience to sacraments. Have you heard of sacraments? So as long as you do the function, that's good enough. Let the church handle the rest. Make sure you get baptized. That's a sacrament. Ever, anyone ever see the uh, Godfather movies? Here he is baptizing his nephew while he's killing. That's a great juxtaposition. I don't need obedience. I'm obeying the sacraments. And so here you have this, this, this scripture verses from 7 through 13. And you think, oh, man, that, that must have been a, something to experience those Christians back then because it just doesn't happen nowadays. And you're right. It won't happen without obedience. The only reason these miracles manifested themselves is because the 12 were obedient. And obedient to what? His word, his spirit. They were instructed to do this. Not everybody is. Because to, be, to practice obedience and to take on the nature of obedience is something that is creative by nature. It's not a code. So I want to talk a little bit about obedience because it's, it's so foreign. And it's, it's, it's an, like I said previously, it's not, a, it's not negotiable. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, All authority in heaven has been given to me. Therefore... As you're going around or go, make disciples. Teaching them what? To obey. Now we have to really ask ourselves, are we as a ministry focused on teaching people how to obey? And if so, what does that look like? Obedience, number one, is the most intimate experience in life because obedience goes down to that very, very core where there's nothing that captures your attention or is guiding you or is enlightening you except God's voice. It is the most intimate. There will be times in which God will put you into situations where nobody else's opinion cannot penetrate to what you're going through. Have you ever gone through something that is so personal, a struggle so intimate that you can't talk about it? That's intimacy. That's where obedience comes in. Where you have no other choice but to seek the kingdom so that you can hear his voice and obey it. 
See, the lazy discipleship way, and I know lazy because I am, all right, is to just tell me what to do, Lord. You guys are like, I'm not telling you what to do. I will walk through it with you. If I tell you what you're going to do, you're not going to seek me anymore because you have an agenda. And everything in church is about an agenda. We can't meet without an agenda. Did you hear that? We can't meet without an agenda. So the thing is, I'm not going to give you a agenda. You're going to have to take one breath at a time. And there's going to be situations where one breath is going to require all of your attention because the stress is going to be so great. That's when you will learn how to discern my voice from everybody else's. And in so doing, hearing my voice be forged into the kind of character that learns to obey. Obey doesn't always simply mean only to do something, although it's usually required. It's to be somebody, someone who's constantly humble, who's not being distracted or moved or maneuvered by the voices in the world, by their own expectations, by their own experiences or history, or by their own wants or desires, but by the word and by the word of God alone. That and only in that place of being does the kingdom manifest power. And when you take a look at all of Jesus' disciples, this is the process that he brings us through. Without that, as a collection of ministry, or as a collection of people doing ministry, there's a great deal that we can do outwardly, but there will be no spiritual power. People will not get healed. <coughs> People will stay in darkness. You know how many people are in Rancho Cordova now from when I first came here? I think there's like 78,000. Now the question is, if we have a ministry of discipleship, then that means there might be one person in Rancho Cordova that doesn't know the Lord. But there's probably a few more. So is the Lord going to direct us in reaching them? And if so, what are we going to do if we can't teach them how to obey? Well, we'll teach them how to be members. Well, that's not bad, but obedience is where the power is. Being able to listen to God, to hear his voice, without that, all we have is modern-day Phariseeism. More interested in making people Baptists or Catholics or Methodists or Lutherans and not disciples. And that's a distraction that has been with us from the very beginning where the Jews were desiring to make the Greeks Jews. So it's not a new struggle. It's just a modern day struggle in our current situation. He summons the 12 and begins to send them out in pairs powerful, gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the road except a staff, etc., etc. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. Here is, here is the instruction to part of, of why he does this. If, you, if any place does not welcome you or listen to you when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Why? Because if you come into a house and all of a sudden there's craziness in the house or disruption in the house, what's your first reaction going to be? Join in or run away. These are common experiences in human relationships. You're there to advance the kingdom. So just stay put and seek the kingdom. When you are done, and when are they going to be done? How are they going to know that they're done with their work? When the spirit tells you. When they're done, if they haven't listened, just shake off the dust as a testimony against them and so that you don't carry their experience with you. You stay focused on you. 
That is a hard thing to do in the community of Christ because we all get focused and have been conditioned with regards to living in this world to be very sensitive to other people's opinions and what they think about us. But ultimately, while that is certainly a factor, the most important part is obedience to his word, not other people's opinion. That doesn't make any person powerful in the kingdom. It makes you a pawn in the world. So the first thing about um, obedience is that it's the most intimate experience of one's life. I've shared this um, scenario before, but I think it's helpful in terms of just understanding that intimacy. And it's a rhetorical question that I present. Where do you think more prayer and sincere and fervent prayer takes place? In a hospital waiting room or on the deck of a cruise ship? And yet, where do all of us want to go? Give me that cruise, baby. And we'll pray to God for the cruise so that we don't have to pray to God while we're on the cruise. We can just enjoy the buffet. It's our human nature. I couldn't point it out if I didn't have it. You don't believe I'd have it? Have you seen my girth? Right. So this is key. Now, in order to be able to obey his voice, we have to become familiar with his voice. How does that happen? You become familiar with his word. Have to ask ourselves the question, how much time do we spend in his word getting to know his voice? As compared to how much time do we spend doing other things? And those other things can actually be in our lives good things. But good things cannot replace the best things. And so discipleship, I, I was, um, I did an interview this last week with KFIA pastor to pastor. And when we were talking about uh, discipleship, John asked me, well, pastor, what, what is your definition of discipleship? I said, well, it's, 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 I'm glad you asked that. It's a, I just go back to the word discipline. Discipline is being, is practicing something so that you can do something in the future that you can't do now. Outside of Gene, does anybody else play piano here? A few? Okay. If you don't play piano, right? And I said, hey, would you please go play some Bach on the piano? Can't do it. I don't care how much you pray in the moment. Ain't going to do it. Lord, please. And then, clink, clink, clink. But if I said, give me a year and an hour a day of your life, and I'll teach you piano, and in a year, can you do it? Yeah. That's discipline. And that's all we're doing is learning the discipline of living in the kingdom. We're not learning anything outside of that goal. And so as we're learning the discipline of prayer at first, like any other time, like any other discipline, rather, we need to set aside time to do it. I remember taking piano lessons and Mrs. Sisson, half an hour piano lesson once a week, had the sheet and said, here's the sheet. I want you every day to write down when you practiced. And then I want your mother or father to sign it. And then you bring it back because I don't trust you. She didn't say she didn't trust me. She didn't have to. Why? Because I know your nature and your nature is going to not want to do this after it becomes boring, after it becomes monotonous, after you have other things that entice you, that, in, that, that distract you. But after a while, I got okay at piano. That's the discipline. Same thing for, for true with learning God's word. Here's a key. You don't need a teacher. And you don't need a pastor. All you need is God's word and his spirit. Period. Pastors may be helpful. Teachers may be helpful. 
I'm working my way out of a job, you know, right? I'm going to get a pink slip this week. We just realized something. You're fired. No. Well, maybe. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Point being is this. You don't need that. If anything, what can be helpful is a mentor who's practicing discipleship. That may be very helpful. But outside of that, ultimately, it boils down to you and God, and that's it. And ultimately, as we practice obedience, the obedience that comes by faith, it is a state of being. It's a state of, I will wait. I will wait until you give me clarity. I will continue to go through what I'm going through, but I'm seeking you. I'm wanting to know you. I'm waiting upon you. I'm doing that with a sense, not of fear, not of anxiety, not of worry, but of confident expectation. And I'll even say joy. Joy. What are you going to do? Now, I will say one thing. None of his disciples had joy Good Friday. None. But after Good Friday, no one could take away their joy. It's okay to smile. No disciple had any joy Good Friday. In fact, Jesus says it's going to be like a woman who's giving birth to a child and she's in excruciating pain. I know because my wife said, you caused me this pain. Anyway, but when the baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy. And he goes on to say, no one will take away that joy of yours. No one can do it. But that joy can only be infused, be forged into your very nature by way of obedience. Not obedience to a church. Not obedience to a person. Not obedience to a code. Not obedience to a culture. Not obedience to anything else but God. God and God alone. That is it. And that is the joy. That is the joy that no one can take from you. When everyone turns their back on you, when everyone seems to be going this way and you know it's wrong to go that way, but you go this way and everyone's starting to talk about you because you're going this way and everyone else is going that way. There's this joy that simply will not leave you because it's not... It's eternally given. It's not given by the world. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give you as the world gives peace. All that is required or essential and tied in as obedience. So my friends in Christ, whatever you may be going through today, personally or indiv you know, individually, collectively. <sighs> Through obedience, there is a joy. Through obedience, as we read in the letters of Paul, in my weakness, in fact, I will boast of my weakness. I'll boast about it because that's when God shines. Not my strengths, not my gifts, not my talents. Those are rubbish. But on his grace and only his grace, that is where the joy is in the obedience that comes by faith. And as we practice obedience, making disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey, to obey all that I command, we begin to realize the reality that trumps every other reality the more we practice obedience. And lo, I am with you always. 
even to the end of the age. Not as a hope, but as a reality. And the things of this earth will go strangely dim. There you go. But that doesn't come without obedience. But it does come. The joys of this world grow strangely dim eh. compared to what God has in store. Let's pray. A lot for us to think about God. We live our lives and run into situations. And this obedience thing is, is foreign to us. But you are faithful to teach us how. You taught Abraham, you taught Isaac, you taught Jacob, you taught Israel, you taught the prophets. You teach every one of the people and disciples that love you are called by your name. Forgive us when we resist that, for that is our nature, and transform us to delight in obedience, to seek it, to relish it, to cherish it, to find it our greatest joy. Yes, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear my word. Hear my word.